your memory. Okay, so we're just talking about memory footprints and going through mem info. And we're talking about this buffer header chain. So your buffer header chain is going to increase is what you're saying. And that's describing stuff in memory that is out on disk, whether it's raw I.O. or cached I.O. It does not describe direct I.O. DMA O underscore direct is going straight from the disk interface, the fiber channel, straight into user space. But this is for cached I.O. and um, raw I.O. Okay? And that's what describes it. That's the header chain. I was talking about BuffView and IRIX actually goes through the IRIX buffer header chain and tells you how many headers each file has, gives you the name of the file, how big it is, stuff like that. I really wish I did have a BuffView that could give me a top of what that buffer header is. So anyways, going back to this, no, not that one. This is going to do what type of I.O.? Uh, cash. Cash. Yeah. Huh? Cash, I direct, imagine. or raw? I would think cached. No. It's slash dev, so it's raw. There's no okay. file system interface on this. Okay? Mm-hmm. So when we read the data in from that disk, it's going to go straight into memory, there's no file system, no inode, no directories, no super block being used here. It's just a raw access to the flat disk space, right? Mm -hmm. So when we read it in, that buffer head has to grow to describe it. If I do cached reads or something, that also will show up as buffer head. Now, I'm in top. Where's that going to show up in top? Um, well, if it's direct I.O. in the buffers, I guess. Buffers. No, direct I.O. won't show here. Direct. we got three types of I.O. The default is called cached I.O., so reads and writes would show up there, assuming I opened a file or something. In other words, I went through the file system interface. Then we've got raw I.O., which is anything going into slash dev, which is what this MD5 sum is going to do. And then we've got direct I.O., which would not show in either of these. That's going straight from the uh, fiber channel interface or SAS interface straight into user space and would not have a memory. It's not going to read it in from the interface straight into memory and then provide it to the application. Direct I.O. goes straight into the application, so that wouldn't show up here. There's a command called XFS underscore make file. That, for example, does direct I.O. DD has a flag to do direct I.O. Okay? Mm -hmm. So let me also bring up a PM chart here. I'm on a different system today, so I've got PM chart on my uh, desktop here. In fact, I accidentally this morning started looking at my own system. So I'm on a uh, e machine here, sitting here, and I was going there. Hey, system time's high, and then I realized, oh, I'm on my uh, Windows. I think this is a uh, Vista on this system. <laughs> Looking at Windows Vista. So anyway, let me close that off. So I needed to pick void one. Then we get CPU. I'm trying to do this quick here so we can see this. And again, have, having a pre-built view helps. So I wanted memory second, disk third. Where is it? There it is. I'm not going to bother with file system, disk space, or networks right now or anything like that. I'm just looking at the basics here. Not seeing any IO operations here. Now let me create a new tab and break out memory in more detail. I don't like the memory layout that they have there. 
I want to be able to stack them better. So again, in memory, oops, wrong system. Here I can see the metrics that are available in my Windows system. You can see everything that I can get to there. But I need to get down to the Floyd statistics here. And again, it's all personal, oops, there we are. It's all personal preference. Word of warning, Brian, I don't like the fact that in the memory plots, I can't make sure that the origin starts at zero. So sometimes I'll pick something that's always going to be small. If I pick it on the slab first and I've got a 60 gig slab, my zero axis starts off at 60 gig for the Y axis instead of zero. And then it looks different. But I'm going to just start off with a slab here. I know that I got a small slab. That's the kernel heap. We were just using slab top to look at the structures. And I want to see the slab grow with buffer underscore head. And then as data gets written, it goes to dirty. We were playing with that a little bit yesterday. Then the flush daemon, and you were talking about dirty background ratio starting the flush, or dirty expire centiseconds, or a sync command, all starting the flush. And then it becomes write back. So write back data is data that has been marked to flush. If you're seeing write backs, remember when we did the NFS write? and we saw the write backs back up real high. So I could have a 32 gig machine, 32 terabyte machine, sorry, and by default, 40% of my memory could go dirty, and I could end up with, uh, you know, seven, six, seven terabyte of dirty write back data that's trying to flush. 40% of a 32 terabyte machine is a lot of dirty data. That's what I call a flush choke. You got too much data, you're going to choke on the flush. And you might be flushing before the prior flush is done. So what is the reason that you said that um, you are not or people are not supposed to use the page cache limit? Is there I found out from engineering that they're not advising it. I'd have to go I don't know if you know Hetty. I'd have to go back to an email from him. It's only for a particular platform, and it's SUSE specific, not Linux community. It was only okay. meant for a particular platform. I, I would like to see it supported, and, I, and I'm u still using it, but I, I have to sort out with engineering where to go with that. But I've been talking about it for since it came into effect. Uh, so we're talking yeah, about a lot of like cash <laughs> limit. Because right. I don't want the, this buffer header and the page cache to get too big because then I have to push it down and trim it. Right, and everything else seems to be built on ratios, which makes it very hard to use but again, all the your But dirty memory. background and dirty are also by megabytes now, right? Yeah. So you can set dirty background instead of 5%, you can set it by megabytes. So anyways, the slab is the kernel heap that grows and shrinks. The process table's in there. Uh, network buffers are in there. You can do a cat of slash proc slash slab info to see all the tables that are in there. Now, I personally don't need to know what every single table is. I'm just interested when I get a large footprint from something, what it is. And then I might end up going into the kernel code or Googling or trying to find out more about that particular table. So there's task structure for PS, and we're talking about buffer underscore head right now. So my default I.O. is cached, and if I write to disk, it's going to go from user space and get, I do a write system call, and it's going to move and get copied, mem copy to the kernel page cache and marked as dirty. And a sync command and a flush threshold is going to cause that dirty to say, let's flush it, and then it becomes right back. Now, I had uh, one site here running Oracle. Actually, I'm sorry, times 10, and they were doing checkpoints of the time 10. Times 10 is a memory resident database engine. doesn't have any spindles behind it. But they were checkpointing, and they were on a 16-terabyte machine, and they were checkpointing these times 10 so intensively that half their memory was right back data. They were flushing before the prior flush was done. So 
they're, they do a checkpoint file, and that was cached I.O., not direct I.O., and half their memory was this write-back stuff from the uh, checkpoint files basically pounding on the system. You okay with that concept? Mm -hmm. So once we actually do get it flushed with the sync command completing or whatever, then it goes to cache clean. And cache clean is a TCP-derived metric. Let me go off here for a second. Cache clean is basically something that I had them add into PCP, and it needs to get fixed, but it was the cache field minus the dirty and the write back. And it should have NFS unstable in it, but nobody's uh, paying attention to that right now. So that's something that PCP derives, basically saying dirty and right back is not clean, it's not coherent. But it should have NFS unstable as well. Okay, now let me get back to. So cache clean is anything that is coherent out on disk, but again, remember, cache clean includes tempfs, shared text. IPCS type of stuff, all that stuff isn't dirty, isn't right back. I did for a while derive and take Shemem out of cache clean, but then sometimes the number, the derived number would go negative. Ibrix had the same problem, and then PM, PM chart would just wipe out and not have any data when it, it couldn't handle a, a negative number. I asked the PCP people to uh, put me in a, a thing saying, don't make it go negative, give me zero rather than negative, but they didn't want to do that. They preferred the kernel give more reasonable balanced book balancing numbers. Okay. Anyway, after cache clean, then I'm going to put in my anon pages. That's my process space. Then I'm going to put in my mapped, and the mapped is attached shared memory. IPCS that's attached. Then I'm going to put in my free. And let me just uh, apply that. Again, I don't like this. I'm going to edit the uh, chart. I'm going to flip it to a stack bar. Because that's what I'm really trying to do is see memory utilization in a stack bar. So there's my 100. 30 gig. I've got a lot of Anon pages. The rest is free. And again, we already identified that Anon pages. You went to the top and sorted by memory, but I put it to sleep so that it would show up easily in top. Okay, so let me do this now. So this is going to read in the entire disk. Now, get this. I had a site that would did a cron event every day and would run MD5SUM on their entire file system and generate checkpoint files. And then their this script way. would actually go into slash dev, and they sit there reading in their entire – oh, look, we've got something going down here. Let's see if I can catch that. Oh, That's I missed buff, ma'am. I'm sorry, my display. Let me add in. I forgot to put BuffMem in there. That's what was missing. Oops, wrong system. Oops, I need to edit this chart. That's the right system. I could go back and edit that later to be able to get it uh, in the proper order, but that doesn't matter to me right now. So notice, oops, let me also get this uh, number of samples. So I'm going to drop out some of this stuff right now. Let me get rid of buff mem, anon pages, and free. 
and look at what happened to the slab. So the slab is growing with the buff mem. Uh, I don't want that one. do my slab top dash s space c we were at 33 mag now we're at 600 mag for that buffer header chain so this is the thing that describes now if that buffer header chain is buff mem or cache clean it's easy to recover that memory and to trim it depends upon what's in the buffer header chain also if I bring up top now Look at what's happening to my buffers. I'm at 24 gig right now. Go back to PCP here, put things back in. So here we can see the buffers, the buff mem growing, getting my free. Now the interesting question will be what happens when we run out of memory? I've got a process of sleep not using its memory. That was that mem hog. By the way, we can see MD5 sum running here. I want to go in F and put in a Y for WCHAN. And I can see it's pure, there, there's no CPU time showing here, or no, WCHAN showing here, and it does show that it's running. Oh, there, we had a sleep on. And that's probably related to the IO. In fact, we got a little bit of IO weight there. Let me do an I here, too. And again, let me try a crash. I don't want to spend too much time in this area, but I'm kind of trying to give uh, Camille a chance to get in. Can't you hear me? Oh, you joined us now? I joined you at 8. Okay. Well, you had that uh, crash. I thought you were off taking care of that crash. Okay. Oh, no, no, a coworker was taking care of that. Okay. No, that's fine. Thank you. Sorry, so I, I heard references to me, game. but I didn't understand. Yeah, no, that's okay. It's kind of hard to hear the, the, the tunnel sound on the phone. But anyway, so I'm going to do a BT on 4809. And I'm going to run it a couple of times to see if I can actually catch anything. And I'm not really catching anything. In fact, I'm not even trusting this right now. I'm, I'm getting this, but I'm not getting any sort of trace back on it. We had that sleep okay. thing going. That's what I was trying to get. So when it's running, it will show active like this. But when it's sleeping, it should give me a better trace back. But it isn't right now. Let me quit out of there. So you can see the slab is growing and that buffer head is growing. Go back here and take a look. A little bit of CPU time associated with it. Here you can see, now this is the standard PCP view and buff mem is growing. You can see it growing there. Other is basically anything that isn't cached. Now again, you ever use the free command? Sure. All the time. The free command is obsolete in my mind. It should be completely rewritten at this point. Shared has always been meaningless. But this is showing me how much memory I got, how much is used, how much is free, how big are the buffers. And again, we're at uh, 46 gig on these buffers right now. How big is the cache? And we've broken the cache out. But this line right here, we're basically subtracting or adding the buffers in the cache. So we take used, subtract the buffers in the cache saying these should be reclaimable if I need memory. So this is what we would call 
here is what the other is. So we take uh, used, subtract the buffers and the cache. That's everything else, which is the slab and the process space. But nowadays, the mem info has this other broken up. So this is what we would call other in PCP. The other one, if I take free and add the buffers and the cache, we think that's available. In other words, I can throw that stuff away and trim it. So this is what we are calling other, and this is what we call available. But it's not really available because that cache field includes dirty, write back, NFS unstable, tempfs, and that stuff is not throw something you can throw away. Let's go back and see what's going on here now. So it looks like I'm just about out of memory now. You can see all the reads that were going on from that as well as we're reading the disk. It almost looks like it's starting to throttle back here in the I.O. operations. I want to do the top F Y. I always, in my opinion, I always want that W chan there. Process either running, runnable, or sleeping. So I've got 57 gig of buffers. I'm down to uh, four gig of memory free. My cache is real small. Again, I still have that stopped process that was that mem hog. I'm going to do an I here as well, Shift W. And I was trying to catch that sleep on, but for some reason I couldn't from crash. I'm not going to worry about that right now, but a PS-E-O, O for optional, Command, comma, W chan, and let's rep for MD5 sum. And let's put that into a watch. Quote that. So now I can see and wait for it to hit that, and this will give me a, the full kernel subroutine that I'm going to sleep on. Not seeing anything there right now. Let's see what we got going on here. So I'm out of memory now. Let me get rid of. Actually, let me go to this one. So now we're in the process of, well, what do I do? Where's my swap? I'm not seeing anything go to swap yet, but again, this is I.O. Applications are going to get the space first. Oh, there, sleep on page killables is the routine that we're seeing from this MD5 SOM. Yeah, I want to break out of there. Let me just kill. So again, I'm just playing some memory games. Now let me try a, uh, oh, what happened here? Yeah, we're all buff mem here. Let me see what memhog does. Let me just go 30 gig here. Memhawk is a standard Linux utility to create a memory pressure situation. So there we can see the Anon page is growing, and it's recovering memory. And if we actually go down and look at the slab, we started this by looking at buffer head. You can actually see the slab is also being trimmed. And if I went to the uh, slab top dash S space C, Let's see if the buffer head is going down, 128, 127, 12 gig, what do we got there? Just trying to make it easier to spot, but can't. So it's about one gig there in this buffer head. Let me turn all this back on. So you can see the tr slab being trimmed. When we run out of memory, the first thing to get trimmed is the slab. 
K-Swap D is supposed to do this. And this is where I was bothered the other day because I couldn't push the slab down. I was deliberately trying to get a big slab. I tried to do a big slab overnight on my Floyd 4, and it ended up dropping to KDB overnight, mm -hmm. which is kind of what I expected. Uh, I was doing hardware counter access with perf top, and it dropped to KDB. Okay, so notice it even freed up a little bit of memory there. Let me just break out of there now. I'm going to do a... I'm going to write to disk this time. And this is not really raw I.O. This is a pseudo device. And this is not raw I.O. So what do we expect to see happen here? Let me get rid of this chart here. Notice when I click on it, it turned blue. I just want to be able to get a bigger picture. So there we go, what's called dirty. Now by default, dirty can get up to 10%. Let's see if I can see anything here. And by the way, uh, I am seeing changes in dirty background ratio here. Brian, you were talking about this. It's flushing before I hit that 10% nowadays with this latest kernel. So here I can see the flushes going on from that uh, DD as it's writing dirty data into slash temp. Maybe the timer just went off, though. So I can actually see a flush occurred here. This is a, let me check here. Uh, SysCTL-A rep for dirty. So dirty background ratio is the point at which it starts flushing, which is 10% or 30 seconds old. And I don't think I hit either of these in this situation. Let's see if I can actually catch it here. So we had a flush right here. We started the data right here, 8049. The flush happened at 80. If it were a 30 second from right here, that put it closer to uh, Right in here is where the flush should have occurred. I'm trying to get 30 seconds on the time axis here from when we started flushing. So there was a flush here, and it went from dirty to right back. But now as we're flushing, notice the dirty is not quite keeping up. We're getting more and more dirty. And we have a constant flush going on right now. Let me get rid of the slab, this other stuff. Look at just the right backs. So right there is where we've got the right backs. And down in here, we can see where the rights were actually starting right away. You can see right here, the cash field growing and our flushes started almost immediately. And we've got IO wait time going on with this as well. Let me put all these back. There's my dirty, but as it's flushing, it's going from dirty to right back, and then right back to cash clean. So during a flush cycle, <laughs> if more pages become dirty, does it see those, or does it have to go through a new cycle? Okay. Uh, there is the flush demon, and it wakes up periodically to look at things. Uh, let's see. Dirty right back centiseconds. It wakes up every five seconds to look at age and ratio. So you can actually see in some of my samples where the flushes are on ticks, and you can kind of see that here. Not real easy to see here right now. Let's see if we can catch it. But you can actually see when things wake up. Let me get rid of some of the stuff here. You can see when uh, case when flush demon wakes up. And, and does a flush, and it's going to be periodic. So there was one right there. I'm not seeing any others right now. 
but we've got a constant flushing going on. Let me get rid of cash clean. You can barely see the right backs. Let me get rid of the uh, slab. Let me get rid of, uh, if I just get rid of the dirty. Oop, I want to get rid of map too. So there's our right back, but it's real, real small. And again, I, that's what I would want. I've got 500, 600K of right backs. There's two ends of flushing. One is a flush choke. That's where I get all my memory and then try to flush it. And the other one is a trickle flush. And right now, this is behaving more as a trickle flush. It's slowly flushing, trying to keep ahead of the dirty. Now, let's see if I can get everything back in. So the flushing was supposed to start at 10% dirty. And notice things are now throttling back here. And by default, that should be about 40, 60. And it looks a little bit less than 40% of my memory. Where was my... Uh, right here. This is the point at which the process would get put to sleep. And that's when you start seeing those sleep on events. Let me try a uh, ps-e-o command w chan rep for dd. Okay, so I'm going to put that into a watch. I'm only doing it this way instead of with top because I want to see the full name. I'm waiting for DD to actually get put to sleep there, sleep on a buffer. And that's going to show up as IO8. Let me see if I can catch that in crash. on it, 5057. Again, you can always echo a T into the proc sysrq trigger. That will have a little bit of impact at the time you do it. I'm trying, trying to catch it, but again, something's funny with this crash. It's not giving me the entire trace back. It's In this case, we're just stuck at the schedule handler. So I'm not, at, for some reason, I'm not able to see that uh, sleep on buffer that we were seeing in WCHAN, and we should we should be able to. There, there we got one. We we actually we're able to snapshot one here now. So you read a trace back from the bottom up. So this was a write. Virtual file system to figure out what it is, and then there is a sync write, and that's doing asynchronous I/O. It looks like here, getting into some generic routines. Figures out is extended three, so then it does an extended three right begin. In here, we're trying to actually do some allocation of these blocks. And then here's your buffer header submit read. And then it did some other routines in here, uh, waiting on a bit. Went to sleep on buffer, that's what we were seeing. And then again, anything that's IO underscore sched will get counted as IO8 time. So this is data IO8. So sometimes uh, we've got one case with Open Vault where they're doing a, a, a T into SysRQ trigger when they get a 30 second stall on one of their probes to figure out what the stack trace looks like for all the processes. The problem I had with crash is I can really only look at one, or I could write a script that would run crash, you know, as a script to get a backtrace on everything that I care about. But it's easier just to echo a T into uh, let me just do it here. Uh, 
And if I do a uh, D message tail dash F, if it catches it, it doesn't like the uh, dash F, it looks like. And here are some of the stack traces. D message is printing out the kernel print statements. They're going into the kernel trace buffer that then gets written into var log messages. By the way, and Brian, too, this is an extremely useful report now that what's called this stuff here is coming out of proc get underscore debug. And I use this sometimes to see what's running on each CPU. Trouble is I can't grep it. I wish there was an easy way to, uh, you know, grep and get just this line to see how everything is pinned or placed. And I'm just looking here. Oh, there was the DD. So here we see the DD running, the PID, other things like that, context switches and stuff. So we were just talking about uh, flushing and the fact that the process will go to sleep at some point. Go back to PM chart. Uh, so look at here, we had a major flush that happened here. And now you can actually see the wake up points of the flush demon. Flush there, flush there, flush there, flush there. That's the uh, right back centiseconds. How often does the flush demon wake up to evaluate things? And again, all this dirty that was here when it flushed became clean. Any questions right now? It looks like my flush is done. Let's see what happened here. The DD is done. I'm expecting that it's uh, yeah, You might have just ran out of disk space. Yeah, I, I, that's what I was expecting. Well, let me go. I think I wrote it into temp. I should have yeah. caught this, but I didn't. Oh, well. So, there's that big file. Okay. Now, all that stuff is clean. If you look at your slab top dash s space c, there's that buffer head again. That's describing this cache clean that I have here. Let me get rid of a non-pages. What's going on here? Uh, where's cache clean? I don't have cache clean in this chart. Huh. I don't know what, what happened there. I forgot cash clean for some reason. And there's that cash clean now. So now let me try pushing that down, memhog. Let me go 40 gig. Take a look here. I do have quite a bit of system time going on right now. Huh. Was not expecting that right now. I got bursts between reads and writes. You can even see the flush demon wake up and do its flushing here. Well, if root is out of disk space, maybe you're. Yeah, that gives us trouble. trouble. Counting data, things like that are going to get corrupted. What's this system time? I wonder if that's due to the perf top. Well, that's what I'm wondering, yeah. I'm just looking at the system time there, not able to see anything really. Isolate migrate pages as part of the trim process. And again, we still have that raw spin lock, IRQ save, read the real time clock. There is some discussion about changing this from Intel underscore idle to another one that is the ACPI turbo mode idle loop. So I'm not seeing anything there in terms of system time. 
Topsys is an SGI tool. And I'm seeing MemHog is all that system time. This is the hard part I was trying to get to yesterday. I wasn't able to see the MemHog. Let's see, PS-E, ref MemHog. The one that I'm running is the second one. Let me do a GDB to that 5221. Unfortunately, it's not built with symbol tables, BT on it. And this is what we can see where it's actually trying to do a clear of memory. This is it basically initializing memory here. But I can't see all the routines that got me there. That would be nice. So where is this now? Okay, so we had some cache clean that looks like it got trimmed. So up here was my uh, non-pages. What's that other green? The buff mam got thrown away here. All that became clean, free, I mean. And then the cache clean also got trimmed down by that mem hog. And where was the Anon pages? So you can let's just go to Anon pages here. And you can see where that mem hog came in and started growing again, still trying to grow. And that's going to result in the cache and the slab being trimmed. You can see a little bit of trim down here on the slab, but also the fact that it's trimming the buff mem right there. Buff mem getting trimmed means the slab's going to get smaller from buffer header. And then the other one was the uh, cache clean. And that one also is resulting in the slab being trimmed. A little bit of system time on it. can't really tell about the I.O. because the range over here is so high. So I've got to kind of wait for some of this noise to go away before I can zoom in. There is a uh, zoom in capability here. So now I can see some of the other stuff going on here. So let me try something else now. I'm going to do a BC free dash A, and that will clear up the cache portion. There we can see the cache getting trimmed. Other is still my mem hog and kernel slab, so we don't see that get trimmed. And here we can see the effect of the BC free. I wonder if we can catch the disk activity. You can see some of the disk activity as we're trimming the stuff that it had to read back in from disk. This is executables and DSOs that had to come back in from disk because of the trimming and the throwaway that was going on up here with the cache field. You can see the cache started getting trimmed back here. Then eventually we hit a few things that we needed that got thrown away and they have to come back in from slash bin. So we're back to that. So now I want to do a uh, MD5 sum on slash temp slash big file. This is not raw I.O. This is cached I.O. So now it's going to read that file in. Well, I got two PM charts up. That's why I was confused before. I'll stick to this one here, get rid of the other one. So there I can see the disk coming in, reads coming in from disk. What's going on here? Oh, that's on Floyd 3. Now I... I'm totally confused what I did. I got rid of the wrong PM chart. Again, I have PM chart on my workstation here, so we're only interested in memory right now. I don't think I, I do have a view here. Let me open that. Doesn't like any of that stuff. Wrong machine.
And again, I like to be able to see a larger interval, so I always go to more samples here. Let me uh, get rid of this one here. I'm a little bothered here still. It's showing DAW e-machine in a workstation here on some of these. I don't like that. Okay, I don't want to go on this too, too much longer here. So here was the DD failing, no space left on device. Let me do a uh, memstat. This is a script that I wrote. Kind of the wrap makes it a little difficult to do. This isn't going to help me. Let me go back to PM chart. I'm just going to build my own memory scene here. I got to get to the right machine. That was my problem before. Let me go to mem, util. And I'm, for me, I usually put the slab first, then buff mem. Then dirty. Then right back. then NFS unstable, and then cache clean. Then the non-pages, which is my process space, the data segment and the stack segment, mapped, which was, again, the uh, attached IPCS stuff, and then free. Let me go to chart, change it to a stack bar, buy. Oh, I don't like the colors. Let me change the colors here. I like free to be green. And let me make mapped. Uh, let's just go with a light color like that. Just trying to do personal preference. So we can still see reading in that file, we have the MD5 Sun. Let's bring up top. And this time again, we can see it sleeping on I.O. again, and we see a little bit of I.O. weight with it. I don't want to go too much longer on this experiment. We need to move on to multi-threading and CPU sets today. Uh, and like, oh, no space left on device. Okay. Well, this should be interesting. Let's do an RM on slash temp slash big file. And it seems to me we've got it open and are doing a checksum on it here. So even though I've removed the file, it looks like, let's see, df-h. Still 100% used. What did I call the thing? I don't see it there. DF-E, prefer MD5 sum. LSOF, type grep MD5 sum. And there it is. It's still open. So even though I've removed the inode, I have not removed the assets and the, the disk footprint from it. Well, look, it says deleted in parentheses, too, which is interesting. Yes, it does. Good. Yeah, good point. It does show it's open but has been removed. But this is a case, again, where if the data hasn't flushed or something's got it open, the disk space is not going to be recovered. And this kind of behavior changes with every kernel. You've got to be careful about that. In some cases, the RM would just sit there until the, the opens are done. Okay, let me do a kill all on that MD5 sum. Do a sync. And we can see some things got synced here. And 
let's see here, df-h again. And I got my disk space back now. So the sync can take care of anything that is in memory that's dirty, that hasn't flushed. Even though we've removed the inode, the memory footprint, and the disk footprint were still there. And here we can see where that file actually got cleaned up. Okay, I'm kind of done playing right now. So uh, my agenda, I was trying to review. We were looking at health of the system metrics here. We started looking at quality of service metrics yet yesterday. When I mean quality of service, I mean time domain. I mean megabytes per second, gigafops per second, time to solution. It's a time type of metric, not a percent busy or number of things using it or number of times per second something's happening. It's not a rate. It's a time to solution, quality of service type of metric. And then we get into profiling. So we've been, just as a review, we've been going into slash proc, looking with SAR and PCP at various slash proc files, slash proc slash stat for CPU time, slash proc slash meminfo we spent a lot of time in for memory, and slash proc slash disk stats. We were also in slash proc slash VM stats for the KSWAP D trim stuff. The second thing that we've been looking at is proc PID, whatever the PID of the process is, and PS, PS tree, and top have been going into there. Yesterday, then, we also started getting into profiling and basically sampling the program counter, and that was perf and PS run. And by the way, there is a newer perf suite PS run from Daniel Thomas. The one I've got is a little old, and I, I was looking for that show event info command, and that's in the newer tarball. The other thing that we talked about was block counting, and this is where we actually add instructions to the program. We instrument the program itself, adding subroutines that count and keep track of runtime as it's running, keep track of things. And with the GNU compilers, a PG, or with ITC, prof underscore gen. And then gprof can look at that stuff. And that can also get you a calling tree, you know, who called who. Uh, C-Lint was the routine that we were seeing yesterday, but how did I get to C-Lint? The other thing then was to look at the software stacks. And that's how did I get to that thing. And this is the problem I've been having right now is I'm seeing that high system time. I know it's from the mem hogs. I know it's spinning on a lock for the memory allocation as it's creating these files. There's one lock per socket, one lock per node. And the problem here now is I'm, I've got eight CPUs on one socket. So if all eight, eight CPUs on that socket are trying to allocate on that node, there's going to be contention on the lock. And I'm seeing that uh, spin time in perf and stuff, but I'm not seeing how I got to it. So that's when I went into GDB. So process is either running or sleeping, and with GDB I can look at the user CPU time to find out how did I get, and I was seeing that mem set SSE4 type of instruction to clear memory out. The other thing I could do was echo T into a proc sysrq trigger to see everything, all the stacks that are the kernel stack. And these three are really for sleeping. So if a process is sleeping, I've been trying to Look at the stack trace there. Look at the, we haven't really done this right now, but be able to get an Arch KDB. And I've been using Crash several times to look at a particular process. The next level of metrics I'm looking at then are traces. I've used S trace a couple of times. I'm going to use it again today. And I've used block trace. That's not actually spelled right. I didn't spell it right there. BLK trace. I used that yesterday to trace each individual I.O. operation. And it's not the subject of this class, but there are tools like block parse and block I.O. mon, things that can take a block trace and generate a report for you. So we were just looking at raw block traces yesterday, and then we used a block parse on that data. Now, 
Now, another thing that we've been going into the statistics for is what's called task stats. I haven't used it a whole lot. I've been in CSA com dash W to show me my wait times, but I haven't used get delays much. That's why I put CSA accounting on so I can get the CPU weight, IO weight, memory weight, swap weight. And then where we left off yesterday, and I want to come back to this a little bit today, is finally getting to the hardware counters. So my CPUs could be 100% busy, but until I get to the hardware counters, I don't know if that is productive CPU time or crashing. I need to be able to get to the hardware counters. So there's something called PAPI, Performance API, and that's a standard interface that works on other platforms and other OSs. It's hardware and software agnostic. One of the things that I used to have complaints about, I'd go to a site and try to teach profiling tools, and they'd have to have a different profiling tool depending upon their platform. We used to have Histex and stuff like that. Well, PAPI standardized it. So if I go to two different sites and they also have IBMs and Crays and stuff, they can still use the same PAPI interface. It's just the hardware counters underneath are going to be different, depending upon the processor. Even going from the Halem to Westmere to Sandy Bridge, the hardware counters are different. So Pappy Avail gives me the hardware counter mapping to the Pappy event. So we're using a Pappy Avail dash D to show how they're defined. And this is where I left off yesterday was doing a PS run to get my hardware counters. And there's a report that we call Perfex, goes back to IRIX days. And I also want to get into other hardware counters. In particular, tomorrow, I want to get into TOB misses. Any questions on this kind of big review here? So I've been drilling down through my data, health of the system, quality of service profiling. I've got to put all three pieces together to say whether I've got a problem or not. So, Brian, in your case, I threw a problem at you, and I basically had a process that would stop sucking up half the memory. Is that productive or non-productive? Did somebody control Z it and forget about it, and now it's sitting there sucking up memory? Was it a suspend resume from PBS or something? So, Brian, I was trying to get you with the dash T to see that this thing was stopped, to find what was stopped, and to find out that all my memory was being sucked up by something that was control Z or stopped. So that's why I'm trying to go through all these pieces to put together the puzzle and try to walk through them as quick as possible. So those are all the different uh, ways of looking at the system, including dropping into Escape KDB and getting into Arch KDB. Now here's where I need to go. I want to take a little break here, but I need to move on into multi-threading. Hang on for a second. Let me share my desktop here. I'm going to go to Floyd 4. If it's up. Oh, yeah, not up. So, again, this is an analysis class. So let's find out what's going on. And I'm going to do UVCon on P4. Now, I had reset it this morning, so I don't know what happened here. It's just stuck there. Oh, I had a cat error. What do we do about a cat error? Catastrophic error. Which, by the way, if you look back a little bit quicker here. UV dump and, re and reboot? Um, not before that. I don't have a problem with that suggestion, but I'm doing control Q. I want to do a UV con. I may not get anything out of this, but I want to do it on R1, I1, B6. So I'm actually looking the BIOS output from these things. Now, there's a good chance that it has something to do. Yeah, we don't see anything. All we see is a CAD error right away. But sometimes you can spot a cat error here. It's possible that a NumaLink port was down. 
let me try the other one here. It was also on B7. And again, I'm not really seeing anything here. It was in pod. So you're right. The next thing I would do is I'm going to go to Floyd SMC. I'm going to do a CMC list. That shows that I've got this UV33 IRU visible to me. I'm going to do UV con, and let's just go to P4 for now. And I can get to the console from it. So I'm going to do a UV dump. And it's going to complain. In this case, i got to specify where the CMC is. Now, I'm going to, things are cable different here. I'm going to use my... Uh, Floyd dash CMC and the public network interface name instead of the uh, CMC list IP address. Again, my CMC has a public port to it on ETH0. And then ETH1 is what the, the SMN is connected through. And this is basically going to, into each of the hubs and grabbing the registers and stuff that are on these hubs. Now, this is traditionally non-catastrophic, but they have been having problems with UV, UV dump. There was a site that tried to put UV dump in as a cron event. And they, in particular, were looking for uh, directory memory errors and NumaLink errors. So they're basically trying to do a sanity check of the UV dump report. And while that's dumping, let me just go back to the uh, agenda here. So I was jumping off to get to Code 2's timing, but we were in, I was seeing timing, so I wanted to do a CSA com and look at the timings, but we were in the 128 seconds, we got down to the 20 second range, we got down to the 12 second range. I want code two to get down to like eight seconds repeatable. And then I need to get that code two multi-threaded. So I'm going to use a dash parallel using the Intel compilers and make it an open MP application and pthread based and then see what happened to it. And what we need to talk about now is the number one problem out there in my opinion and that is communication overhead between threads. This is what I kind of call phone tag. Basically the threads talking to each other saying are you done, are you done, are you done, are you done. And there are two ways to synchronize on these threads. One is a spin. And that I'm just seeing this saying, are you done there? You're 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 done forever. And I, I can lock up an application. It can spin, get no work done, and I want you to see what that spin looks like. The other type of communication synchronization is a yield. With that one, you're going, are you done there? You're done there? You're done? No. Get yield. Give the CPU up to the kernel, and hopefully the kernel will give it to somebody that can use it. So OpenMP and MPI, multi-threading, p-threads as well. For example, a, a p-thread underscore uh, join. The join function is saying, wait for all my threads to join me. That is a synchronization point that you could get stuck in. The other thing that happens in multi-threading is known as false cache sharing. This is, I describe this as like being a marathon run. The gun goes off and all these runners are tightly packed and stepping on each other's feet, tripping up, and they're not going to get very far if they keep falling over. False cache sharing is when multiple threads are writing to the same cache line. A write to memory is going to result in CC NUMA coming in and directory memory being used, which is an SGI-specific feature of the hub, it will go to directory memory and say, what CPUs are sharing this 64-byte cache line? And then broadcast an intervention to them. Now, this is known as a hot cache line, and it's a scalability problem. Now, I've got a little program example, Pi. 
And if you do an, compile it with an O0, you'll get false cache sharing problems. But when I go to an O1, the compiler will automatically pad the cache line. In other words, let's just say that it's an 8-byte object or item variable, 64-byte cache line, that means 8 variables on the cache line. What the compiler will do is decouple them and possibly pad 7 bytes in there, or I'm sorry, 7 objects in there, uh, 56 bytes get wasted on the cache line. But then that has decoupled the objects on the cache line from all the other objects. That way, when I write to that one object, I don't have seven other variables on that cache line that have to be resynchronized. And this is what CC NUMA and directory memory is all about, is I write to memory, the hub goes to directory memory to figure out from the cache line state a bit set for every CPU that has a copy of it. It uses that bit mask to broadcast or really multicast across the NUMA link to every node that has a copy of it. The hub on that blade then converts that CC NUMA, NUMA link protocol to snoop cache. And then the processors on that blade only see the snoop cache for their blade. And they're not sitting there watching the entire memory machine and contention for what's going on with the snoop lines. Uh, get ready for break here, but I also need to get to MPT and start running code 6. And again, we have communication overhead. MPT also has a spin versus yield situation. And then I want to get into MPI run stats and tune the code 6, and then also profile it with MP inside. And then lastly, I need to get into CPU sets. So I'll take my Floyd 4 and put in a boot CPU set and an interactive login CPU set, and then get PBS using CPU sets, and then submit my work through PBS. And then I need to start pinning things down. So this is actually getting me to a dedicated, private, isolated CPU. I'm on the same CPU all the time. If you remember yesterday, and I was bothered by it, I saw a lot of migration threads. The CPU scheduler was going crazy on this kernel that I was running yesterday in Floyd 4. So I'm hoping to get rid of that once I lock everything down. And then I've got to worry about affinity to say where in memory is that thread's memory footprint. So there's a dlook command, but I've got a dlook summary and then I want to look at the CPU set dash Q on this code 2 MP and code 6. That's today's agenda. Any comments, questions? I'm going to stop the recorder. Let's take a little break here and then come back to uh, multi-threading.